Hello, my name is Beverly Tumala. I'm a certified heart failure specialist. And today we're gonna to talk about living with heart failure, medications and therapies. <clears throat> In the last segment, we talked about um, when the body doesn't get enough oxygen rich blood, it causes heart failure. So what is actually happening inside the body when the, the body doesn't get enough oxygen? Um, we used to think of heart failure as a a mechanical problem. The heart's just not able to pump, so if we make it squeeze harder, things will get better. But back around 1985 or so, we learned that um, heart failure is more than just a mechanical problem. Um, when the, uh, the blood, excuse me, when the body doesn't get enough oxygen-rich blood, um, we ca it causes activation of the neuroendocrine system. And so plasma levels of um, neurohormones like noradrenaline, renin, angiotensin, vasopressin, all of these things rise. Initially, it's a compensatory mechanism. It's meant to keep the patient going and keep them from feeling badly. But as these neurohormones continue to get pumped out, it becomes very uh, detrimental to the heart function. So activation of these neurohormones will eventually lead to worsening symptoms of heart failure. The heart function continues to worsen and these patients um, have a very high mortality if we don't shut the systems off. These neurohormones or stress hormones have the following effects. They will constrict arteries and the tight arteries make it harder for the heart to pump um, against the high pressures. Um, they make the patient retain salt and water. So fluid builds up in, in these tight blood vessels and eventually leaks out into the gut and the, the legs, which we talked about um, earlier today. Also, extra salt and water in the body will cause the patient to get thirsty. And uh, this is a very um, difficult disease to manage because the thirst center in the brain is um, altered and these people are very thirsty and they drink a lot and it just makes the problems worse. So as the fluid builds up, the heart works harder. So neurohormone activation continues and what happens if we don't shut this system off, the heart will remodel. And as the heart remodels, it begins to enlarge and get big. It gets weak, and the, event, the um, EF eventually drops. So again, it, the 50% is normal, so these patients can drop into their 40s, 30s. And again, I've seen patients and treated many whose ejection fractions have dropped into the 10-15% the range. Or the heart can get very stiff and relax very, um, just have a very poor relaxation phase and symptoms continue to worsen. So early on in my career, uh, when I first started nursing and when I was in the ICU, um, we would only treat patients basically um, with the symptoms. So we would treat their symptoms by giving them diuretics or water pills to alleviate the fluid congestion and get rid of the extra water. And then we would also give them drugs like digoxin or lanoxin, which basically help the heart squeeze and just alleviate symptoms but we weren't stopping that cascade of neurohormonal activation. So around 1985 or late 1980s, we started using drugs um, called ACE inhibitors and ARBs. And, um, and then further on, we started using beta blockers. And both of these drugs work in relaxing the blood vessels, decreasing the workload on the heart. And then the beta blockers, um, eventually we found had many more benefits from that and we'll talk about that in a moment. So water pills. Those are your diuretics. Um, basically they just help the kidneys make more urine and get rid of the excess fluid. The uh, diuretics that you'll be seeing the most of and are the ones that we use now are Lasix, Bumex, Demodex, Hydrochlorothiazide, and then there's one called Xeroxylin or Metolazone and I call that the booster. As patients begin to build up fluid, they may need a higher dose um, of the water pills just to increase the effectiveness. And that's why I like to go back to drugs like xeroxylin or metolazone. And um, I nicknamed it the booster because I would teach my patients if they begin to um, experience fluid buildup and if the water pills quit working, we would sometimes use metolazone once or twice a week just to augment and increase uh, their urine output. Also, if we have them on max doses of Lasix or Bumex, we can also use Aroxalin to, again, enhance diuresis. So um, 
there are ways to get rid of this excess water without putting them in the hospital. And um, as again, and I keep saying this, um, just remember that diuretics lose their effectiveness when patients build up fluid. The gut is edematous, there's a barrier. So as the, the patient takes their pills, they don't absorb all the medicine and it just gets passed on. So you might hear them say to you, you know, I'm not urinating as much as I used to. And that should be a key for you to think, hmm, I wonder if they're building up fluid. When patients are markedly volume up with acute symptoms, meaning they're very short of breath, they're very uncomfortable, um, we usually will, admit, will administer the diuretic in the IV form. And we can do that in, the, in the, the emergency room. We can do that in the office. Home health can also do this at home. So this is a great way to bypass that edematous gut, get rid of some extra fluid, and eventually make the water pills work more effectively. With all diuretics, we need to monitor electrolytes very closely, especially, especially the serum potassium, renal function, like the BUN and creatinine, and serum sodium. These can all um, elevate in w using um, lots of uh, diuretics. Um, potassium usually requires replacement of some sort, and we're all used to that. And let's talk about that for a moment. We know that the body needs potassium. Heart rhythm depends on a normal potassium level, so it's so important that we monitor potassium levels and make sure they don't get too, too low. And we know that food alone cannot replace the amount of potassium that's removed by the diuretic, so we have to give, that, give it to them in other forms. These are all very familiar to you guys. Um, K-Dor, Micro-K, KCL, those are those I call them the horse pills, the big, thick, white pills that we give all of our patients, or the nasty orange liquid that we make them drink. But um, many of our patients need to be on these to keep the potassium levels where they should be. Um, I'm also going to talk about uh, two medications, um, aldactone and Inspra. These are potassium-sparing diuretics, and we're using these a lot more in heart failure, and let me tell you why. These potassium-sparing diuretics are, again, very mild diuretics, so the patient won't notice that they're urinating a little bit more, but it tells your kidneys to hold on to potassium, so it won't let the potassium leave the body. Again, the two drugs that we use are aldactone or spironolactone and Inspra, and the other name for that is a plerinone. Um, when we use these drugs, it can also elevate the potassium, so we have to watch potassium very closely. Um, another added benefit and why we're using these drugs more often is we found that these drugs block a stress hormone called aldosterone. And again, heart failure patients make an excessive amount of aldosterone. Aldosterone causes um, retention of water and retention of salt. And also, um, it can make the heart failure worse. So we have found in studies like the RALS trial that blocking this hormone um, can prevent heart failure from getting worse. And what I like is it prevents those patients from taking those big horse pills. There's also uh, sources of, of potassium in our diets. We all know about bananas, but there's many others. Um, and just looking at this slide, you'll see that you know raisins and prunes, avocados, tomatoes, beans and peas, grapefruits, oranges, those are all very great resources for potassium. I had this one patient, um, every December, he would come in and get labs drawn uh, during the month and his potassium was always high. And um, we hadn't changed his medicines, everything remained the same. And we came to find out that he would get those little baskets of dried fruits every, you know, for Christmas. And he would eat dried apricots, dried prunes, and his potassium was, was following in suit because he was consuming a lot more potassium. So if you start seeing things like that, ask them, what are you eating? What are you doing? Just so you know. And um, another big problem with um, high potassiums are the use of salt substitutes. Because since we tell the, these patients to limit their amount of sodium intake, they will use salt substitutes. And all salt substitutes use potassium chloride instead of sodium chloride. And it's a little saltier than salt, but that might be a source for potassium. All right, let's talk about the next group of drugs, the ACE inhibitor or the ARB. The angiotensin-converting enzyme inhibitor or the ARB are medicines that we typically will use for high blood pressure. Um, they limit the amount of angiotensin the body makes, and angiotensin makes the arteries of the body get really tight, so it makes the blood pressure go up. So if we inhibit it, 
the blood vessels relax, and the blood pressure goes down. We started using these in heart failure, and we found that there were huge benefits. Patients felt better, they lived longer, and they stayed out of the hospital. So um, all the studies showed that this was a drug that benefited heart failure patients. And it didn't matter if they had high blood pressure or not. If their blood pressure was normal or low, we would still start these medicines. And we got an, a benefit of these three things we just talked about. Symptoms improved, hospitalizations reduced, and their life was prolonged. The ACE inhibitors are drugs that you would know as the Pril drugs. Enalapril, Lisinopril, Bosinopril. Um, these drugs are now generic. They're cheap. You can get $5 a month at HEB or Walmart. This is lifelong therapy. Um, this is a pill that I tell my patients you will never stop. Unless your heart doctor stops it or a kidney doctor stops it, you will remain on this drug till the, the very end. Um, a common side effect of these drugs are a cough. And um, I'm sure you've all heard the patient say, you know, I just start coughing and I can't stop. Yeah, that's a very common side effect. Also, um, this drug can make elevation of potassium in the bloodstream. So it helps with the potassium issue. It can cause blood pressures to get too low. So we have to really watch these people for low blood pressures. And there's also a, 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 another side effect called angioedema. And this is um, more common in our African-American population. They'll take an ACE inhibitor. And um, when you take an ACE inhibitor, if the, there's a, a release or an accumulation of a chemical called bradykinin. That's what causes the cough that we see. But bradykinin can make um, African-Americans that are very susceptible to it develop this angioedema, which is basically swelling around the lips, their tongue, and their throat. So it can be very dangerous. So I would always warn my African-American patients, if you start noticing that your lips are getting swollen, tingly, or the tongue starts to swell, you, know, you need to go to the emergency room and stop this medication. So if a patient can't tolerate the ACE inhibitor because they've developed a cough, they've developed angioedema, we use the angiotensin receptor blocker. Um, an ARB, and um, they work the same. They both inhibit the renin angiotensin system. Um, just one doesn't have the side effects. So uh, your ARBs are the Losartan, the Valsartan, the Candesartan. You would probably recognize them more as Kozar and Diovan. And again, these can be used interchangeably. Uh, we typically will start with one of the Pril drugs, one of the ACE inhibitors, and if they don't tolerate, then we'll move to the, the ARB. A word of caution to using these two drugs, whether it's the ACE inhibitor or the ARB, is you need to tell your patients to avoid use of any of the anti-inflammatory drugs. Those are your ibuprofen, your Advil, your Aleve, Motrin. When you take those drugs on top of an ACE inhibitor or an ARB, it interferes with the benefit of the drug. So we tell our patients do not take the two together. Um, it can cause the heart failure to get worse by causing fluid retention. It can also cause renal injury. So unfortunately, our patients with uh, arthritis and aches and pains, you know, Tylenol is probably the safest bet for them. But always reinforce, do not take um, Aleve, Motrin, Advil, those type of drugs. Then we're going to talk about beta blockers. Beta blockers um, came into the the scene about early 1990s. And we started using them in clinical practice around 1997, 1998. And this drug has changed the face of heart failure. Um, what it does is we know that patients with heart failure have an extraordinary amount of adrenaline and norepinephrine, the fight or flight hormones circulating in their body. When that happens, the heart works harder. The blood vessels tighten, the heart rate goes up. If we don't stop this cascade of symptoms, the heart will fail. So the beta blockers block the effects of the adrenaline and norepinephrine. Arteries relax, the heartbeat slows down, and the heart is able to just kind of rest. And as it rests, we start seeing healing. So as the heart rests and slows down, it is able to pump more blood to the kidneys, Sodium and extra fluid are passed in the urine. Over time, heart failure symptoms improve and the heart function improves. Let's talk about that. 
This has got to be my favorite drug. By blocking the effects of the sympathetic nervous system, the adrenaline, the norepinephrine, the heart function or the EF can improve. So the majority of patients who start a beta blocker and complete um, titration up to the, the maximum dose that, that we want them on, majority will have an improvement in their injection fraction by at least seven points. Some of our patients will even normalize their heart function. The drugs that we typically use now are Coreg or Carvedilol or Topral XL, the long-acting metoprolol. And every heart failure patient should be on this drug, period. Um, this is, again, revolutionized heart failure care. When I first started the heart failure clinic back in 1997, we would transplant, transplant about 25 to 30 people every year. And once we started using beta blockers, uh, the numbers kept dropping and dropping. And nowadays, we only transplant maybe one or two out of our clinic a year. The long-term benefits of this drug, again, is it improves symptoms, keeps heart failure from getting worse, prolongs life, it will improve the ejection fraction and can even normalize the heart muscle. Let me say that again. It can even normalize the heart muscle. So there's hope now. Patients with heart failure who um, 10 years ago had a heart failure exacerbation and were told, you know, your heart's weak, you know, you're going to need a heart transplant, are now walking around living normal lives because of this drug. The most common side effects are early on. Um, as we start this, this type of drug, the carbetalol, let's say, we, um, we will see that patients will have a tendency to retain a little more water. They might get fatigued a little bit more. And this is where our part comes in because our job is to be their cheerleader and tell them, you know, I hate to say this, but it's no pain, no gain. So I would cheer them through this phase of therapy and tell them, as soon as we get to the, the proper doses, you're going to feel better. So what we have to do, we have to really start very low and go slow. So we increase it little by little. So um, carvedilol, for instance, um, the patient will initially be started on a very teeny tiny pill, and it's at 3.125 milligrams, and they'll take that twice a day. And it's better tolerated with food because it slows the absorption. And um, over time, we'll double it. So they'll come back in two to three weeks, we'll double the dose to six. They'll come back three to four weeks after that, we'll double the dose again. So early on, they might have the symptoms of being fatigued, dizzy, uh, might retain a little bit of water. And then about three or four days, those symptoms subside and they feel okay, and then we double it again, and then we double it again. So it's a very close relationship we develop with these people, but as we get into the higher doses, they start to notice, you know, hey, I do feel better. So this is lifelong therapy as well. They will stay on this drug until, again, the very end, until we're smarter in knowing who can come off the medicine and who needs to stay on. So even if the heart function gets better and improves or even normalizes, they will at least be on an ACE inhibitor or a beta blocker for the rest of their lives. The last drug I'm going to talk about, um, just in the group of heart failure drugs, is digoxin. Um, again, this was a drug that was very popular back in the 70s and 80s and even the 90s in heart failure care. Um, it's helpful in some patients with a weak heart. We use it now that if a patient continues to have symptoms on maximal therapy, we will add digoxin to hopefully alleviate symptoms. Digoxin won't make them uh, live longer. Digoxin may keep them out of the hospital, but there's really no, more, no mortality benefit to digoxin. Digoxin basically just blocks an enzyme in the cardiac cell, and the heart muscle can contract a little harder. We also use it mostly now for irregular heart rhythms, such as atrial fibrillation, to keep the rate controlled. Um, and then we all know that the problem with digoxin is we can have problematic toxicity, and we have to monitor serum levels periodically. Sometimes we have to use IV medications in our heart failure patients. Um, IV drugs are used either short-term for relief of sudden, or se of sudden symptoms or severe symptoms. We talked about the diuretics already. So if they're developing, uh, if they've got overwhelming heart failure symptoms and they're very congested, we'll switch to IV diuretics for a dose or two to just enhance diuresis, get rid of the gut edema so the pills work. 
There's another group of drugs that we sometimes use, um, IV, and uh, these are the inotropic drugs like dobutamine and milrinone. And I'm talking about these because we don't typically use these only in the hospital anymore. We can put patients on a continuous drip at home and they'll wear a small pump and have a pick line and then they'll we'll infuse this drug 24 seven. Um, so this, these home infusions alleviate symptoms. They make patients feel better, but again, there's no mortality benefit. This can even um, hasten mortality. It can cause arrhythmias and things. So we don't like to use it a lot. We will use it sometimes for a bridge to transplant or for palliative care. So if the patient is end stage, they're not feeling well, we'll put this, on the, this drug on them and just make their symptoms better and keep them more comfortable at home. The next thing I'd like to talk about are therapies for heart failure. So we've already talked about the medications and the many medications that they might have. Well, other things that your heart failure patients might experience or get, um, one of those things is a specialized pacemaker. Some heart failure patients have an electrical delay in their heart muscle contraction. And this delay is usually caused from a bundle branch block. So as the disease infiltrates the heart muscle, it can delay conduction through the ventricles. And that's how they develop a bundle branch block. So the heart chambers contract out of sync and the heart function is less effective. So basically one side of the heart contracts first and then the second, then the other side does. So the right side might contract right just before the left side. So there's no forceful contraction together and that decreases the heart's pumping efficiency. So what we want to do is make the chambers contract together and that's what the biventricular pacemaker does. Uh, we put a lead in the left side and a lead on the right and they fire at the same time. Another one that's very common, and I'm sure you will see patients with this, is the internal cardio defibrillator, or ICD. It's an implanted device. It looks like a pacemaker, but what it does is it monitors the heart rhythm 24 seven. And if the patient develops a serious life-threatening heart rhythm, it will shock it within seconds. Just like we would use the paddles in the emergency room or during a code, this does the same thing internally. Precautions that we have to take, um, you know, patients will say, oh, I can't have a microwave if I have a defibrillator or a pacemaker, and that's no longer the case. The only real uh, precaution that we ask them to take are to avoid large electromagnetic fields like an MRI or uh, security when they go to the airport, so they have to be wanded. Um, also, other things that have, micro, or that have uh, uh, magnets are cell phones. So I just have my patients just be careful with their cell phone. If they're a, a man and they like to carry their cell phone in their, their shirt pocket, I tell them just move it to the other side, on the opposite side of where the pacemaker is or the defibrillator is. Avoid talking um, on the phone on that same side. Just move the phone over to the other side. Again, these are very sensitive to magnets. Um, it's kind of drawbacks about these things is they have to be monitored you know, uh, regularly. So they need to see their pacemaker doctor about every three months. But um, there's now, uh, the, we have the ability to regulate these at home. So patients can have a monitor at home and transmit data to their doctor. So um, they're just getting easier to use. We're using these a lot more in patients. Um, let me tell you about who gets these uh, devices. A defibrillator, Typically, the time that we implant them is when, after the patient's been put on maximal me medical therapy. So they're on a diuretic, we've added the ACE inhibitor, they're on a maximum dose of beta blocker, and we usually let about three months go by on max maximal medical therapy. Then we go back in and we measure that ejection fraction by either an echo or a heart cap, um, but typically an echocardiogram because it's non-invasive. And then when we do the echo, we're looking again at the ejection fraction. So our goal is to get the ejection fraction over 35%. If their ejection fraction is over 35% on these medicines, we don't really need to put in a defibrillator. If their ejection fraction doesn't meet that 35% mark, then we talk to them about a defibrillator. So during this time where they're waiting for the three months, uh, many times doctors like to put what we call a life vest on these patients. And basically it's an external defibrillator. And you may have seen these. It, um, it looks like a, um, 
a vest with suspenders, and there's pads that are attached to the front and the back. And the patients wear these 24-7, except when they're in the shower, and it will monitor the rhythm and will shock the patient if it ne they need a shock. But they're very cumbersome. Patients find them very difficult to wear. And so, you know, most of the time these are very short, short-lived. They'll wear them a week or two and then go in and get their defibrillator. The next thing we'll talk about is a VAD, or a ventricular assist device. Uh, you probably won't ever see these in practice, but I just wanted to mention them because they're becoming more and more common. Um, back in the day, remember when Barney Clark got the first artificial heart? Well, think of Barney Clark and where we've come. We now have these small pumps that we can place in the chest right at the, at the bottom of the heart, um, at the bottom of the left ventricle, to boost the blood flow. So we put this pump in, patient has um, a, a line that comes outside of the abdomen that plugs into batteries, and they wear a battery pack with them when they're out, and then at night they plug themselves into a battery pack and just keeps this unit going and keeps it, it, it functioning. And so we're seeing these a lot more because we're putting patients on these devices while they're waiting for heart transplant or we've now been approved to use them as um, a long-term therapy or what we call destination therapy. So some of our patients who are not transplant candidates or who do not want a transplant will get one of these um, assist devices put in if their symptoms are very, very severe and we can't keep them out of the hospital. So let's now talk about overview of our therapies. We talked about medications and how they have really enhanced in the last 20 years and we use them now to target the neurohormonal activation, which causes heart failure to worsen. Um, and there's a lot of medications our patients have to take. The diuretic, the ACE inhibitor, again, which is a lifelong therapy, beta blockers, which are also lifelong therapies, potassium replacements, um, whether it's the big horse pill or the use of spironolactone or Inspra, and digoxin. Our advanced therapies include the, bi the biventricular pacemaker, which is cardiac resynchronization therapy, or internal cardio defibrillators, and ventricular assist devices. So that ends this session on medication and therapies for heart failure. You can refer your questions to me at btumala at hcpoftexas.com.